Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, there was a double rainbow over the Roubaix Outdoor Velodrome at the weekend. I'll be looking back at how the two races were won by Kopecky and Van der Poel, as well as, unfortunately, running you through a list of medical reports from a tour of the Basque Country that was making the headlines for all the wrong reasons. This week in the world of racing, we learnt what it means to find out you made it onto the podium of Paris-Roubaix. He won and Petter Sagan in 2018. So Lotto Kopecky joins a select group. Look at the reaction of Vifa though. Podium in Paris-Roubaix. We also learned that if your handlebars come loose over the cobblestones, all you need to do is grab an Allen key and tighten them up yourself. And finally, we learned that the new chicane slash U-turn slash hairpin bend introduced before the Arenberg Forest this year didn't lead to the carnage that a lot of people expected. Uh, but that's because the race had already been split to pieces by that point by one team. Uh, like Flanders seven days earlier, Alperson de Koenig went into Paris-Roubaix as the clear favourite and for the second Sunday in succession, they more than lived up to expectation. It didn't take as long as I was expecting for the early break to go, around 35 kilometers. It was the same in Flanders, wasn't it, last week? For a few years now, we've generally had a very long fight to get into these early moves. And I'm wondering whether, because of that, a few more riders are sitting back at the start thinking that they'll save their matches for a bit later and start going with some moves then. Well, if they did do that, they left it too late. Seven rides initially went up the road, including the likes of Askerain, Tiller and Stranhagenus, uh, later followed by two more to make it nine. However, uh, far from keeping a nice advantage over the first few sectors, they saw their lead plummet. As soon as the race hit the cobblestones, with over 160 kilometers still remaining, one team and one team only were in control of the entire race, Alpes in de Kearney. Uh, they, and Oscar Rizabic in particular, rode so fast that the brake was already caught before the midway point of the race. Uh, my one worry for that team at that point in the race was that they'd run out of domestiques for deeper into it, leaving Van der Poel exposed to tactics and maybe numerical advantage from other teams. I needn't have worried. Uh, Timo Kielik and Ed Planka were able to control things all the way to the Arenberg Forest, saving vital energy for Vermeers, Philipson, and most importantly, Van der Poel himself. Uh, he put in a bit of a dig over the Arenberg, just as he had on the second ascent of the Quaramont in Flanders last week, and you could already see he was the best rider there. A small but significant gap opened up over Mass Pedersen behind him, and the other ominous sign for the Dane was that Philipser wasn't having any trouble following his pace. Uh, the 10 or so kilometres just after the Arenberg was the only moment in the race where it looked like there might be a chance that things could unravel for Albersin. Uh, Phillips had punctured, and whilst he remained really calm and kept on riding until the team car came up, it did mean that he'd have to stop, which would momentarily leave Van der Poel isolated in the front group. Not for long though, because Vermeers rejoined. But it was Vermeers who inadvertently caused a minor panic for Van der Poel just a few moments after that. So he made a move that was only followed by Stefan Kung and Niels Pollitt, two of the biggest motors in cycling. And you could see Van der Poel behind, first on the radio and then reluctantly accelerating himself, very aware of the danger that move posed, even with his teammate present. His saving grace at that point was Lidl Trek. Once Matthias Vatiek had Paul Pedersen back after another puncture, he proceeded to drill it on the front and bring the gap down to the front three, so crisis averted. Uh, that all happened over the course of around 18 kilometers, and it was just eight k's further down the road that Van der Poel made what would be the decisive move. So with exactly 59.7 k's remaining, he put in a searing acceleration down the left-hand side. Uh, 200 meters later, most fans watching knew what the end result was going to be. Nobody could come close to matching his speed, and with a couple of corners at the end of that Orshi sector, he carved out another couple of seconds just with his bike handling skills. Uh, 10 seconds soon became a minute, and then a minute and a half just 12 k's after that initial attack, and the gap didn't really stop increasing from there to the finish. And there's not a lot else that you can say about his ride, other than that it was complete domination. So instead, I'll run you through a few stats. So his average speed for almost 260 kilometers was 47.8 kilometers per hour, which means for the third straight year, we've had a new record average speed. Uh, I know there'll be people watching this for whom miles per hour means more. So I'll tell you that equates to just under 30 miles per hour average. And with all those corners, with all of those cobblestones, 30 miles per hour. I also timed how long it took him to cover that final 59.7 kilometers solo, and he did it at an average speed of 45 k's per hour. 
His winning time was five hours and 26 minutes. The sort of duration that not so long ago, you'd expect the shorter semi-classics rather than the longer monuments. His winning margin was exactly three minutes over teammate Phillips in second and Pedersen in third. That's the largest winning gap at the race since Johan Museo in 2002. He became the first rider to do the Flanders Roubaix double since Fabian Cancellara and the first to do so in the Rainbow Bands since Rick Van Loy all the way back in 1962. Uh, Van der Poel now has six monuments to his name, putting him level with the likes of Museo, Binder and Moser and one short of Cancellara and Bonin. He's got a few to go though to get to Merckx's record of 19. Uh, Van der Poel hasn't even ridden that many monuments just yet. Uh, he was reluctant to reveal though in his post-race interviews whether or not he would be competing at liege baston liege in a couple of weeks' time, but I am expecting him to be there and at Amstel Gold this Sunday. I mean, he's clearly got the legs to give even Liège a good go, it's just a case of how much motivation he has left. Uh, some other stories from the race, and firstly, was I the only person who could not believe that Lawrence Pithy got straight back up after that crash in the finale? I don't think I've seen a rider bounce like that off a road in quite a long time. And I was certain he'd have done at least a collarbone. But no, he literally bounced back to take seventh on the day and round off what's been an incredible Cobbage Classics campaign for him. Gianni Vermeers made it three riders in the top six for Albertin. Uh, he was man of the match in many people's eyes, whilst Maddis Mikhails took a top 10 at the age of just 20. Talking of young riders, August Jensen of Ineos was the youngest participant since World War II. He made it to the velodrome and did cross the finish line, but unfortunately he won't be given an official result as he was a little outside the time limit. His teammate, Josh Tarling, was disqualified after taking the stickiest of sticky bottles. Uh, it was really quite tough to watch him, how emotional he was when he learned of that decision, but there's just no excuse for holding on at that sort of speed to get back to a group of favourites. Uh, he will be back, and of course even more determined, I'm sure, this time next year. Tom Pidcock was the best finisher for Ineos in 17th place, but it felt like a miracle that he was there in the first place. As you might remember from last week's show, he crashed in the recon at the Zulia time trial on Monday and couldn't put any weight on one of his legs. That's quite the recovery from there through to Sunday and the most brutal race in the world. Søren Varanschel took his first monument top 10 for Uno X men's team with a ninth on the day, whilst Mass Pedersen was actually the first Danish rider on the podium since the very first edition, which was 128 years ago. The last thing I'll mention from the men's race was poor Tim van Dijker. Uh, the Visma Lisa bike rider had sprinted to what he thought was a top 10 position at the race on his debut, only to then get relegated by the Commissaires. The reason for that relegation was riding off the track itself on the inside when he made an attack which really seemed harsh in my book. I'm sure it's something that track aficionados would be well aware of, but to me, it didn't really look any different than Van der Poel cutting almost every corner and using the dirt and grass at the side of the road to his advantage. Anyway, time to get on to the women's race now, which was a rather more cagey affair for the most part, despite the same wind direction on the day. It was all back together ahead of the first of the 17 sectors that they tackled. I say it was cagey, it was actually much more in the mould of how the men's race has often been in the past, i.e. lots of riders getting steadily dropped off the back sector after sector without any big moves getting big gaps off the front. Uh, Lotta Kopecky was the most animated of everyone, mainly with attacks off the front, but also in calling up her team car when she needed that Allen key to tighten her bars. However, try as she might, she was unable to really establish any sort of lead, even with a small group. At least not for any length of time in the initial stages. Mariana Voss was always quick to follow her, Balsamo too for the most part, and with both of them backing their sprints, there never seemed to be too much cohesion and they were normally caught. Kopecky tried again on the Orshi Les Orshi sector, taking Vos, Schweinberger and Georgie with her, uh, but this was where Ella van Dijk really started to shape the race. With no lead or trek rise in that front group, she drove the pace behind and soon closed the gap. Now, at that point, it looked like van Dijk was purely in there as a helper, but she was so strong that she soon found herself off the front and attacking. Uh, sensing the danger, Kopecky jumped across to van Dijk with Vos and Balsamo glued to her wheel, and that was the winning move. Uh, Balsamo had what initially looked like a mechanical problem, what we can now only assume was a very bad moment in the race for her. Her saving grace was that of Pfeiffer Georgie chasing behind, still trying to get back on after getting tangled with her teammate. Uh, the two of them made it back to the front, and it was that group that would contest the win. Now, one of the keys to Kopecky's success on the day, in my opinion, was how early Balsamo opened up her sprint in the velodrome. Uh, Voss, to her inside, didn't want to get boxed in, 
And so she was forced to open up her sprint early as well. That gave Kopecky the perfect lead out. And when you combine that with her power and track experience, it was a very comfortable win for her in the end. Uh, Balsamo was a disappointed second, Voss an even more disappointed fourth, with a delighted five for Georgie, taking the third step of the podium. So congratulations to Lotta Kopecky. Uh, there have been doubters over the last few weeks, including myself. I just didn't think she looked like she had the same punch as last year, but she's just won Paris-Roubaix for the first time in her career. Given how well she's been climbing this year, I'm now really looking forward to seeing how she gets on at Liège, which she has never competed at before. I'm just going to quickly wrap up Schelda praise from last Wednesday now. Uh, both races ended up in a bunch sprint and it was no surprise to see Lorena Vives triumphant in the women's. So there have been four editions of the women's race so far, but only one name on the list of winners. Tim Malir continued to single-handedly save Sudal Quickstep's classic season to a degree by winning the men's race ahead of Jasper Philipson, who'd found himself boxed in in the closing stages. Just before I move on to Idzulia, just another nod to our shop, where our t-shirts and sweatshirts dedicated to the early season races have been going down really well. So thanks again to all of you who've made a purchase so far. And I know that a lot of you have been reading the articles that we posted over on globalcyclingnetwork.com over the weekend from Paris-Roubaix. So our website team was out there on the ground getting all the major stories from in and around the race. So well done to them. Right, let's get on to the tour of the Basque Country, which is one of the most anticipated races of the early season. Three of the big four stage race riders right now, Roglic, Vinegar and Avonapool, were all in attendance, and it was a mouth-watering prospect to see them all up against each other. However, all three of them crashed out. Unfortunately, we don't have any rights to show clips from this particular race, but I'm sure you've all seen the horrific crash that occurred on stage four probably too many times. And the sorts of images that we never want to see, and it really made for quite uncomfortable viewing on the day. I'm just going to run through some of the injuries from the incident. So Jonas Vinigal was stretched off in an ambulance and receiving oxygen. And once assessed at the hospital, he was initially found to have sustained several broken ribs and a broken collarbone, whilst further examinations revealed that he'd also had a pulmonary contusion and a collapsed lung. Remco Avenapol walked away with a broken collarbone and scapula. And it puts into context how nasty that crash was, when you come away thinking that he got off lightly with those injuries. Uh, he will, of course, miss the Ardennes Classics now, but should be able to resume training in plenty of time to be at 100% for the Tour de France. Primoz Roglic, despite having crashed hard the previous stage as well, fortunately came away with no broken bones, so it shouldn't be long before he's back into full training. Uh, it remains to be seen, though, whether he'll still compete at Flesh Wallon and Liège Baston Liège as planned. Steph Crass wasn't so lucky. His team, Total Energies, reported a right pneumothorax, several associated rib fractures and two dorsal vertebral fractures, in addition to several hematomas, wounds and abrasions. That sounds really nasty. But possibly the worst off of all of them was Jay Vine, who remained motionless in a ditch for a long time after the crash. A UAE have reported that he'd fractured a cervical and two thoracic spine vertebrae. Uh, the only good news for Vine was that the injuries were deemed stable enough not to require surgery, which was a relief to all of us who feared the worst. So he's going to remain under observation in hospital and then in the next brace for at least six weeks. And for a more complete picture of his condition, you can have a look at Bray Vine's Instagram page, where she gave a detailed and quite emotional update just a couple of days ago. Uh, other riders were also involved, but I'm sure you've had enough doom and gloom for one racing news show. It goes without saying, but we wish every rider involved a swift and complete recovery. Uh, si and I, though, will be discussing on the GCN show tomorrow why there seem to be more and more crashes in pro cycling. Or are there more? I mean, that's a question I've been asking myself over the last week. Because I wonder whether this year, so many of the really big stars of the sport have been involved in the two biggest incidents. So maybe it just feels like there have been more. Uh, anyway, whilst many people lost interest in the race after that particular stage, I shall run through the final results. Juan Ayuso became the youngest winner of a World Tour level one-week stage race in about 20 years, and it was his first overall GC success in a race of that level. It had been Matthias Schelmoser who'd gone into the lead of that race, basically through default after that crash, but he'd have to settle for third in the end. Second on GC was Carlos Rodriguez of Ineos, so he moved himself up 19 places on the sixth and final stage, which he won, the first World Tour level win of the season for his team. Right, let's move on to something else now. So a quick update now on team wins so far in 2024. Uh, UAE have a bit of a gap at the top of the table on the men's side. They've already racked up 21 wins so far this season. That puts them three ahead of Visma Lisa Bike and eight ahead of Sudal Quickstep and Lidl Trek, who are both on 13. 
Uh, Ineos remain near the bottom of the table with just three wins so far. Not sure what's going on with them this season. Whilst Cofidis are the only team of that level who are yet to get themselves off the mark. Uh, one non-World Tour team of note is Israel Premier Tech. So they've taken 14 wins at point one level or above so far this season. And I wanted to mention that purely because of Joe Blackmore. Now, you may remember me mentioning him already this season because he won the first two stage races he did in Rwanda and Taiwan. And, well, he's just added a third straight success. His stage win and overall victory at the Circuit des Ardennes last week won't count towards that team's tally as it was only a 2.2 level race. But nevertheless... That's a seriously impressive start to the season. I have no doubt there are now a few teams knocking on his agent's door, so expect to see him at World Tour level next season, or at the very least, on the Israel Premier Tech full squad. SD Works have the most victories on the women's side, with 14 so far, but Lidl Trek aren't quite as far off as they were last year. They've taken eight. Uh, Phoenix de Koenig and Canyon Sram are the two teams without a win so far. In terms of individual wins, Malia, Pedersen and Vinigal are tied with seven each. Pogaccio is on six, though, albeit from just nine days of racing. Lorena Vibes has amassed six wins herself from 13 days of racing, and Kopecky is now five from 12. Just one more piece of news before I wrap up for this week. Leonard Kemner was also involved in a serious crash whilst training in Tenerife last week, where he was hit by a car. There was a worrying lack of news, actually, after it was initially revealed that he was in intensive care. But thankfully, he's now been moved to the normal ward where he's recovering from a severe chest trauma, rib fractures and a lung contusion. So get well soon, Leonard. Stay safe, everybody. I'll see you again this time next week to wrap up the Amstel Gold races. And hopefully there won't be so much bad news to report there. See you then.